for singing with us this morning. You may be seated. <coughs> Good morning, everybody. <coughs> Before we look at Scripture today, I have several things that I want to <coughs> mention to you. The first two, it depends on how we look at it, could be sad, um, but <clears throat> there's a victory that we have as Christians that makes it different. This past Tuesday morning, very early in the morning, Dale Belden went to heaven after battling cancer for about a year. There have been a few times that he was able to 
uh, be here um, or attend the Thursday morning Amazing Grace. Um, but <clears throat> less and less as things got more difficult. Um, and just a month ago, he wrote a letter that he had delivered to me to read whenever I wanted to. And today is appropriate to read it. <clears throat> Dear Pastor Dan and HPC Church family, this past year has been pretty rough with many changes in our family and also our church family. So many friends we no longer see. The hardest part of being away from church is not seeing the people. We felt like we didn't really have a choice in order to avoid any complications, but just to stay away. Without the support and prayers of the people at High Plains Church and others, this would have been a terrible journey. The past year has been very difficult for many reasons, yet the good Lord has brought us through. Please communicate our gratitude to those who have helped in so many ways. Office staff, pastoral staff, and the Amazing Grays have all been very supportive. It has been good to know you. Obviously, my time is not up. That was a month ago. But I did not want to put this off until it was too late. All of you consider yourselves hugged from one old guy to the rest of you. See you in heaven, basking in the light of the Lord. Gratefully, Dale Belden. Dale knew God. <clears throat> Monday, we read scripture and prayed with him. I believe he knew we were there, though he couldn't respond much. And I would, I don't know where I would rate it in the top 10, maybe, of my pastoral ministry of the sense of God's presence there and assurance this is one of mine. Uh, this is one of my children that I'm about to gather to myself. <clears throat> and Jan is here today. That's a testimony of the grace of God. 64 years they spent together. And this is a testimony to the scripture, we do not sorrow like those who do not have any hope. Christians die differently and grieve differently. <clears throat> and then, just before the service this morning, um, I went by <clears throat> Johnny Belden's dad mom's home and we had prayer with her dad, Ernest, who likely is not long for this world. They thought he might not get through the night, but read some good promises and prayed with him this morning. Um, and so not only do we need to pray for uh, her folks, but Scott and Johnny have been through a lot here. Scott losing his dad Tuesday, and it seems shortly, Johnny, um, they have, we trust that all goes well, they have a grandson uh, due to be here tomorrow <laughs> into the world. A um, lot going on, so <clears throat> they need our prayers. Then on another different kind of um, testimony of God's faithfulness, His supply, His goodness to us. Today is the uh, 10th anniversary of our first Sunday in this building. And, you know, it hardly seems like it's been that long. 
what impressed me here probably a month or so ago as it hit me, we're coming up on the 10th anniversary, is how God's taken care of us in providing our needs. We, um, 10 years ago today, when we held our first service here, we, <clears throat> let's see here, I didn't do all the math too well. We, we had roughly, we were in debt then, 10 years ago today, $5.4 million. And this building was um, seven, cost a lot to build uh, then. <clears throat> and at that point, we, we owed about um, 790000 to people in our own congregation that um, loaned money to us. Another 500000 to um, a group of people in the church that purchased a large tract of property here, um, then sold the 20 acres to us, and then mortgaged it for 500000 to help with the building costs. Uh, we had 4.1 million in debt to um, local banks. <clears throat> so there's where we get our 5.4. Today, the congregational loans are some were forgiven, written off, the rest have been all paid off, and the current um, mortgage that was 4.1 we've as you know a couple of years ago we were able to move from the banks to um, a church organization that were a number of denominations are part of the Wesleyan Foundation um, Investment Foundation we were able to borrow from them and we now owe them 1.6 so this has been amazing um, what God's done for us in supplying our needs. Um, the last, the recent, and I want to mention this, a dear soul that um, I think most of us know, but, but um, some may not have known, Jean Faust, who uh, didn't make a splash here. She always sat in the very back row, and she would usually be um, one of the first out, and, but she had a rich life of benefiting other people. And after a difficult struggle with cancer, she passed away this last year. And unknown to us, had um, left some of her estate to us. And that enabled us to um, retire the rest of the congregational debt and let me say this I mentioned that to one person who knew her well it prompted that person to go to um, their attorney and change their their will and include us in it may that tribe increase <laughs> <clears throat> it's not a bad thing um, so anyway, those are some things God's done for us, including just as um, happy in the sense, true sense, taking people who've been a part of this flock and who've prayed and witnessed and lived and volunteered and worked to heaven, which is supposed to be our purpose anyway. Every one of us here are here on a trek we trust that will land us safe in heaven. And we've seen some of that even this week. So we thank the Lord. Let's briefly bow our heads. Father in heaven, we just want to pause and thank you that you are the great God the Most High God. You keep your word. 
you are infinitely powerful, infinitely wise, infinitely good. We thank you, Lord, for the whole range of blessings that you give us, all the way from marvelously supplying needs to walking through the end of life with your saints. And you've said, precious in the sight of the Lord are the death of his saints. It is grief to us because we're left. You understand that. But Lord, they are ushered into your very presence with all those who have gone before them and the great hosts of God. And they are in bliss today that we are told in Scripture that surpasses what we're even able to imagine. So for everything you give us, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Isaiah 53, a few verses in 52 are the scriptures that I want to look at today. <clears throat> and looking at the whole doctrine, the, the core Bible teaching of atonement. And the fundamental question as we approach Easter. Why? Why did God have to come clothe himself with flesh, walk and talk and live among us, and then die for us. Why was that inescapable, of all things, for God? It was a necessity for God. Had to be. If we were to be saved. In Isaiah 52, 13 begins what is... I think everyone would agree the most sublime prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. And it is a little hard to follow because there are really, in a sense, there are two, maybe three speakers here. There's God the Father. There's Christ the Son, even though this is in the um, Old Testament, not as clear yet, the Trinity. And then there's the voice of Isaiah the prophet. And so, it's a, in a sense, it's a conversation that sometimes is a little hard to follow. But beginning in <clears throat> verse 13 of Isaiah 52, this is the Father speaking and referring to Jesus the Son as His servant who lowered himself to come into this world and die for us and take upon us the penalty for sin so that we could be saved, became a sacrifice for us. Behold, my servant will prosper. He will be high and lifted up and greatly exalted. Just as many were astonished at you, my people, so his appearance was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. Thus he will sprinkle many nations. Kings will shut their mouths on account of him. For what had not been told them they will see, and what they had not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Isaiah is saying here, all he's been writing and preaching has been little heeded. For he, this is the Christ, grew up before him, that's God the Father, like a tender shoot or babe and like a root out of parched ground. Remember this this next verse. This is the truth about Jesus. 
that we miss. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Every single picture we have of Jesus is attractive. He wasn't. And God, who sent him into this world, had a choice to make him look like anything he wanted to look like. He intentionally sent him in a human form and apparently appearance that was not attractive. That tells us something about God, but listen, it also tells us something about what God knows about us. We are shallow as can be. And he knows it. So he says, if I send somebody that looks like he came out of central casting in Hollywood, they'll be attracted to him for the wrong reasons. They'll follow him because they're swooning. So he intentionally sent Jesus ugly. We're, we, we, we imagine incorrectly. He sent Jesus with nothing it says that would be attractive except the truth. So the people would only follow for that reason. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In other words, all the sufferings he went through, the onlookers considered that God was doing it to him because he was bad. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people, to whom the stroke was due? He took, he took the blow that was due us. His grave was assigned with wicked men, yet he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his seed, his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. We'll look at that verse and explain it a bit later. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he, the Father, will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, that's Christ, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore I, that's God the Father will allot to him, the Son, a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his death, his soul, unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. I don't think there is a chapter in Scripture like that one. Here's what we see there. <clears throat> and to build on what we have been looking at, what Jesus did on the cross. And there are three things that I want us to see here today. Number one is 
penalty. I mentioned last week several different doctrines of the atonement that are riddled with error. And many of the doctrines of the atonement have a strange, and especially in the last, say, 10 years at the most, there's a new kind of doctrine about the atonement, even within what you would, what people would call themselves Bible believers, that we could describe it as a bloodless atonement. And it's even, now frankly, <laughs> I've said this probably before, it's a good thing that I don't have the power that God has. I might misuse it. Um, they describe the atonement as I am describing it, and this chapter describes it, as Christ being given for us by the Father to suffer the penalty due us so he could justly forgive us. They describe that Bible teaching as divine, I'm not making this up, divine child abuse. Why would a good father put his own son through the sufferings that Jesus went through when he could just mercifully forgive us all? What's the problem? First of all, that's wicked thinking. I don't care if it comes from a pulpit. But second, it's an abysmal ignorance of God and who God is. And I don't need to rehash what I've said the last several weeks because God is holy. He has no toleration and never will have for willful sin, rebellion against Him. He won't ever, ever, ever negotiate or brush it under the rug, shrug it off, ever, because He's holy. He can't. If He did, He would compromise with sin he would somehow, which is unimaginable, but he would, he would destroy himself because he's holy. There is a penalty for sin. And here's what we have to summarize all of Scripture. Either the one sinning pays with his own life or a substitute does. Somebody going to die because of sin a blood sacrifice is required for God to be able to then forgive the rebels he cannot not exact the penalty for rebellion he can't overlook it and he can't say oh it's okay he can't true in a true sense he can only be merciful to me in one of two things. One, postponing the inevitable punishment, which is why we're all alive today. In the Garden of Eden, God would have been perfectly justified, in not only ending our spiritual connection with Him, but our physical lives and just being done with us. He would have been perfectly justified. And the only reason He didn't is because of the grace he showed toward that couple that he loved and created. And he, though they spiritually were cut off from God and we instantly wither and die spiritually, he kept us alive physically. Sheer grace. So that being physically alive, he had time and we had time for him to restore the spiritual link that was broken by rebellion. That's the only reason we're alive. He keeps us alive in order that we have time to get back where we belong spiritually with God. Therefore, when you look at it in a, in a proper way, spiritually if we look at it from God's standpoint the only 
meaningful purpose for all of life. Paul laid out in his sermon on Mars Hill in Athens when he said God created us and sustains us so that we might some versions grope so we might even though we're in darkness that we might grope after God that we might find him that's God's only reason for leaving us alive so we can seek him restore his likeness and his life in our hearts so really what else matters now God knows we have to go to work we have to earn a living we have to pay you know the, our bills we need a place to live he, he knows all of that he knows our needs but all that is merely supportive of life so that we can seek God find him walk with him talking to Johnny Belden this morning reading some scripture, getting ready to pray with her dad. She said, and I, di I didn't know this about him. She said he was saved when he was 12 years old in a street revival in Portland, Oregon. Just a street preacher with a tent. And this, I don't know, would have been in the 40s or the 50s. And he got right with God, and then Johnny's mom spoke up, and she said, she met him, of course, maybe another 10 or 12 years later, and they were married, and she said, he's never deviated. He's walked with God all these years. She said, I've never heard a thing out of his mouth that shouldn't have been there. He's, he's walked with God. That's the purpose of life. So really, when we look at it, just a few blocks from here is a human that has fulfilled the ultimate purpose, which is to get back connected to God. And now God apparently is preparing to bring him to what he has long, God has long drawn him to, and he has followed, and he's on the threshold of the end, aim of everything. <clears throat> Jesus then paid a penalty that was due for sin. The idea of a substitute is an ancient one, it's not only in Scripture, but it's also in pagan religions. There is a... Um, one of the arguments for the existence of God is called the moral argument. That is, the <clears throat> pervasive evidence, even in people, groups, that have not seemingly ever had any connection with what we call the civilized world, which probably is the greatest privilege they could have. They never met anybody that was supposed to be civilized. Um, at least then they know whether they're a boy or a girl. Greatest privilege you can have is to not have any connection with civilization. Anyway, just needed to get that in. <clears throat> There's no place where an untouched tribe or whoever doesn't have a fundamental, innate, spontaneous sense of moral right and wrong. Now, it may be quite convoluted. It might be quite twisted. But there's a fundamental sense that you're not supposed to do this and you are supposed to do that. And that if you violate that standard fouled up though the standard might be there's some consequences for it that either you pay or 
a substitute pays. An animal. That is a unique proof of the moral origins of us. Now, again, the sacrifice could be read of a tribe that had this notion and they were utterly untouched. Nobody knew where they, they couldn't have, they didn't have any idea where they got this. But they would kill, they would kill a goat or some kind of animal and they would, sp they would sprinkle its blood for, I don't know, 10, 15 feet in a jungle path. And the bad person, the person that did whatever, walked on that pathway, stepping on that blood. And when they got to the end of it, then they were okay. Now, who put that idea in their heads? It surely got twisted, bent out of shape as far as what the Scripture would tell us. But the fundamental notion that there is a punishment, that I have to offer something to avoid the punishment myself, and that the punishment I deserve falls on a substitute, that's amazing truth that God has instilled in a heart and you know it takes other forms you you know every year you got to throw a young virgin into the volcano then the crops will grow yes they're twisted but the fundamental idea of a code of moral ethics and consequences for breaking it is everywhere this is just the right one from which every other one, even twisted ones, flow. Jesus, then, is a substitute for us and a true substitute to bear a penalty for us in a substitutionary way is this. The innocent suffers for the guilty. A guilty person purchases nothing when they suffer a penalty that they owe. That's the whole point here when he said that Jesus took upon him the stroke or the, the hit, literally is what it means, that is due to us. If I die for my sins, I had it coming. It's my just desert. But if, a, if an innocent substitute dies in my place, that penalty, not being due to the substitute, then can accrue to me when I put faith in that substitute as being a substitute and as bearing the penalty that was due to me. Then... It is effective. Then the satisfying of the penalty is credited to me when I put my faith in that substitute. So there's a penalty that is cr clearly here. We have to remember this, um, too. We, we cannot let the notion that because God loves, that somehow penalty and punishment are mutually exclusive. The truth of the matter is, he, he made it clear in Scripture regarding parents and children. He said, a parent, you ever read this? He said, if you do not chasten your son immediately, you hate him. I can't tell you the number. I just, I just love him so much. I just hate the discipline. I just hate. I can't spank him. I hate to give him. Of course, the worst thing of all is a time out. You know, I just can't. Listen, no, you don't. You care for them. You correct them. God said, I chasten every child that comes to me, all of my children. 
Why? He says, so that they will be partakers of my holiness. So they'll be like me. So if I, when I just let a child or whoever go, I don't love them. God loves me enough that he won't leave me alone. (laughs) That's both his holiness and his love drives him to always be tinkering with us. (laughs) He won't leave us alone. And whatever he doesn't like, it's amazing. He gets around to telling you quickly. I have talked to so many people through the years, and I've said to them, they seem to can't ever get squared away with God. What, where are you hung up? What, what, what are you doing? Are you doing something? Uh, you know, habits or whatever, or doing things in your life that you know you shouldn't do. I, I, just, I don't know. I just don't know. <clears throat> I have occasionally taken um, the words of a seminary professor that taught both my father and my son. He just said to someone, I heard him. Are you, you know, are you guilty of some place? I don't know. I just don't know. He, he said, take a really good guess. Yeah, we do too, no. Why? Because God tells us. There's a penalty then, and that is, that is completely compatible with love. We've, we have remade God in our image. Remember, He made us in His image. We have done a neat switch. We don't like all about Him that He's revealed, and so we just remake Him. We switch it around to where He's palatable to us. So we've, made, we've remade that God in heaven in our image. He doesn't discipline he pats us on the head. If you weren't, weren't here, um, and it's not a world-shaking illustration you, need to, you have to remember, but he, if we view him as a cosmic Jim Lewis, the beech nut gum guy that I grew up around, well, he's a great guy because he gave us beech nut gum. We want a beech nut gum kind of a being in the heavens. And he, he won't do that, <laughs> I've discovered. <clears throat> so penalty and love are perfectly compatible. The one does not rule out the other. In fact, they require each other. Second, here's a big word, but it's used in Scripture only three or four times. But the second thing is propitiation. John uses it, Paul uses it. And you know what the re- root word for that is, the Hebrew word for propitiation, mercy seat. Mercy seat is the lid that covered the Ark of the Covenant. Inside were the Ten Commandments, the jar of manna, so forth. Above it was the cloud which symbolized God's presence. And it was the mercy seat where God and man met On the Day of Atonement, the high priest, it's the only time the high priest all year was to ever go in to the Holy of Holies in the presence of God himself. And he said, you ever come in here any other day, you'll be struck dead. You don't come in here like I've explained it, you'll be struck dead. There's incentive to really be on your game. (laughs) There's tradition <clears throat> that, Jewish tradition, that the high priest, first of all, he, always, he had on his robe uh, ringing it, little, little tiny bells. He could be heard in the Holy of Holies, moving around, putting the blood on the mercy seat and so forth. And that let him know he, didn't, he hadn't gotten struck dead. <laughs> and that there was a rope around his waist so that they could pull him out because nobody could go in there. And the mercy seat was where they would take the blood of 
offerings, and they would sprinkle it on that lid, thus making atonement, blood offering, punishment, penalty. But it, what's this called? The mercy seat. God can have mercy now that a penalty has been met and he can offer mercy and forgiveness to us. So there's a penalty, there's propitiation, and then finally, there's a provision. I don't have time to go through all this, and I wish I did, but salvation is, and I can't do this in one minute, but I'll have to. Salvation is provisional, meaning it's conditional. Some might say or believe and some teach, as I mentioned last week, that because God poured out His wrath on the substitute, His own Son, who is innocent, He therefore has made atonement for us all. So the question is, why would He be mad at me? So what if I sin? He's already paid the penalty through His Son, it's no big deal. I just need to, as one person put it, swipe the Jesus gift card. I'm paid. It's because salvation is not automatically purchased by Jesus from the Father, and then all I have to do is just get the gift card and swipe it. Salvation is provisional. And here's the awful thing. The incredible price that Christ paid sufficient to forgive us our sins can in my own case go completely unused never claimed because I have to apply for it myself by faith and genuine faith is not some little sentence I know I'm a sinner and Jesus died for my sins and I ask you to forgive me and so I'm a Christian no faith faith is the condition for salvation but faith has conditions too and the conditions for faith to be real faith repentance utter surrender to God and discipleship obedience Jesus said don't call me Lord if you don't do what I tell you to do so it's possible from that little verse, and I've got to quit, but it's clearly possible for every one of us to verbally profess Christ and not be a Christian. The scene Jesus painted in the Sermon on the Mount was at Judgment Day. He said many in that day, many, that word ought to scare us, many will say, Lord, Lord, we did wonderful things in your name. And he'll say, Depart from me, I never approved of you. I never acknowledged you. So, faith has to be faith. This great salvation that God purchased for us at the death of His Son has to be applied for personally and has to be maintained. I've got to continue to walk with God. Well, <clears throat> a lot here. I would like to ask you to do something. If you'd read the latter part of Isaiah 52 and all of 53, I want to finish, um, do a better job of looking at this passage. We'll never plumb its depths, but um, we'll finish a few things that I want to cover still in it next Sunday, the Lord willing. So let's bow our heads. And Dan, if you will come and dismiss us, please, with prayer. We come to you this morning, Lord, with humble hearts. This is... heavy information that we're learning as we go through this series that our pastor is giving us and laying out the scripture before us to fully understand exactly what you did but why you did it. 
And when we think about it, as we read this morning, Lord, the things that you went through as our substitute for those of us that know you should have an impact on us, Lord, and should help us to have a desire to maintain that relationship that we have with you. Those conditions that you put in the scripture, Lord, are to assure us through the witness of your spirit, but also to assure us that we're okay with you to have that peace in our heart. So as always, Lord, as I pray often in this room, when we close the service, I know you're faithful to speak to our hearts. I just pray, Lord, by your grace and by your mercy that we would be obedient to whatever you're talking to us about today. If I'm not right with you, Lord, if there's a person sitting in this room today that can say, I'm not right with you, I've not accepted that, or I verbalized it and it didn't come from my heart and it was prayed in vain, Lord, glue them to their seats until they make this right with you. And if we've confessed with a genuine faith, Lord, that you are Savior and Lord, help us to never forget the price that needed to be paid that that penalty needed to be fulfilled, but that price that you paid on our behalf, our substitute. Lord, may that deepen our faith and strengthen our walk with you and give us even more of a desire, Lord, to go out from this place today to share the hope that lies within us, especially as we lean into this Easter season. So, Lord, the words thank you seem so unworthy when we hear a message like we did this morning but thank you is what we have and may each of us do as the apostle paul commanded us to do offer ourselves up as a living sacrifice to you in jesus name we pray amen love you guys you're dismissed have a great day everyone